sometimes. The projector doesn't make it so clear, but you should know that if this is a bar magnet, this is the field that you would expect um, coming out of the positive, coming into the negative, and then the circular field line. And similar if you've got a coil with a current in it. And so this is pretty much what we estimate the Earth's magnetic field to look like. And so this is the Earth. The bar magnet is slightly offset to the side, and you've got these field lines coming in and out. And so that's why the geographic North Pole is slightly different from the magnetic North Pole. Um, and the magnetic equator is equator is slightly offset from the normal equator. And this angle difference is called the declination. And so we put the declination in yesterday into the software because we were taking into account this main magnetic field and the anomaly that it induced. And so you've probably seen these before. So the inclination and declination, inclination angle is actually the angle of the field lines coming into the Earth. So I should find a better picture, but if the field lines in South Africa are coming in at an angle of minus 65 degrees. Um, and so that's your inclination. And like I've just said, declination is the difference between magnetic north and true north. <coughs> and you can actually calculate that inclination, tan of I is equal to 2 tan of lambda, which is the latitude. So it's, like I've said, the inclination is dependent on your latitude on the Earth because obviously it's then dependent on those field lines coming into the Earth. The inclination and declination changes, and so here's your change with latitude of inclination. As you can see at the equator compared to the poles, there is a significant change. So if you did a survey in, for example, DRC or in Angola, you wouldn't use South Africa's inclination when you're doing your magnetic modeling because it makes a big difference. Um, secular variations in the past few hundred years, so each year there actually changes um, in the magnetic field. Does everyone know that we're heading towards a reversal in the Earth's magnetic field? And so the, our field strength is slowly becoming weaker and weaker, but also the location of the magnetic north pole varies through time. And so this is a plot of the variation. We can see in 1576 it was there and it slowly moved around in this direction. This is inclination and declination. And so there's been a change and it also depends which city you're in. So also when you're doing magnetic modeling, you put the year that you did the survey because it's, that will affect um, what the Earth's field was at that time. Also what we mentioned yesterday is that when you've got a body here, so this is like a dark within the Earth, you can see the positive and the negative um, of the dark hole anomalies. Then you've got a person here with a magnetometer doing a survey over the dark. And so there's two things that you usually measure. You've got the Earth's main magnetic field, and so in South Africa, like I said, it's coming down at minus 65 degrees, the Earth's field into the Earth. And then this induces an anomaly here. So um, it's got a very high susceptibility, and so itself it has own fields coming out of it, and so the fields on this side of the anomaly add together, and then the fields on this side cancel out, and that's why you've got this negative and this positive. And like we saw yesterday, this depends on two things. It depends on the orientation of your survey, so are you going north, south, or east, west? The shape of your anomaly will change, but it also depends on your latitude that you at. We'll look at it just now, whether you're at the equator or whether you're at the North Pole will actually change the shape of your anomaly. So like I said, magnetics is a bit more complicated. Gravity, you'll get the same anomaly wherever you are, um, within a reason, because there's also a latitude correction for gravity, but magnetics is a quite significantly different anomaly. And so here, your induced magnetization in this body is equal to the susceptibility of the body times by the main field. So this main field coming in that induces this magnetic anomaly. Um, okay, this is the picture I was talking about. The anomaly of a buried magnet. So here's your geological body of interest. So the main field coming in has induced a field inside of the body. As so you can see it here, the field lines are going away towards the right hand side and coming in on the left here. Um, and so at the surface, you can see there's the change in direction of these field lines. It's coming in on the left and going out on the right hand side. 
But then at the same time, you've got the main magnetic field, which here is in this direction toward the right hand side of the board. And so you've got to add these two vectors together and get the resultant vector. Over here, we've got um, the main magnetic field is this dashed line on top. This line here is the induced field in the body. So the resultant field is this line here going into the earth with the two triangles. And so it's quite a, a large vector. And so that plots up here in positive. And so it's the addition of these fields that gives you an ultimate anomaly over the body. And you can see this anomaly is not as regular as the previous one we've been looking at because it's an irregular shaped body. There's different types of magnetism as well. So paramagnetism, you've got an odd number of electrons in the outer electron shield. And so as soon as you apply a magnetic field, they all then generally start to align, but not significantly. So this, these type of rocks don't have a very strong susceptibility. Um, they're small and they're positive. Ferromagnetism, and you can see here ferro is for iron. So this is usually in rocks that have a lot of iron in it. Um, there's a perfect alignment of electron spin directions within a large portion of the material referred to you as domain. So a large amount of your electrons are lining up with the field direction. That's why you get a much higher and stronger anomaly. Um, and yes, we mentioned this word curing temperature. And so this is the temperature above which a rock gets heated and it loses its magnetism. So it kind of the magnetism gets reset above this temperature. So I've got just a curve here. And so you can see strong magnetization in a rock um, up until around 500 to 600 degrees Celsius, and then the magnetization falls away because the rock has been heated up and starts to become molten and loses its uh, magnetization. And then some values, also just to keep in mind, we spoke about it yesterday, that your rocks that have a lot, a high magnetization are the ones with iron in it. And so you can see all of these chemical formulas all over that have iron. And the names that you can get used to are magnetite and hematite. Those are your two important ones. Um, yeah, I don't stress too much about those. So the, you can see the curing temperatures vary quite a bit, but usually around 500 to 600 to 700 degrees Celsius. And then the susceptibility values um, are in SI units. And so you can see values can get relatively high, but more important to note here is there's a large range. So it's a bit complicated. Even when you go out into a field and you collect multiple rock samples of the same rock type, that will give you quite a varied range. So it makes it a little bit more, more difficult for modeling. Here are some other values. Sedimentary rocks, we mentioned yesterday, very low values. Barely anything that you'll notice when you do modeling. Whereas you now start to look at the igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks, and the values start to increase. Still not that high. So compared to the previous page. So the previous page you had magnetite getting up to 20, whereas none of these go over zero point something. So you've got basalt, gabbro, granite, and then there's the dolerite, but dolerite is usually an intrusion and that can be quite high. That's a terrible picture of what a magnetometer looks like. Data acquisition, this is what your data would look like that you'd expect a magnetic field in nanotesla and quite large values, so you can see 50,000 up to 54,000. And this is because of the local field in that area. So remember yesterday we were using the software mag to see and it asked for the intensity, the inclination, and the declination. And the intensity is specific to that area. So in South Africa it's about 28,000. I'm guessing this is Shetland Islands Theirs is about 50,000. And so it's not these, you can really just remove the 50, and when you're in MAG 2DC, you often remove the big values because it, it doesn't deal with large numbers, and you would just model this 2,000 or this 4,000 values. So it's not so important, it's typical of where you're doing the survey. And so you can see here, Meta Gabbro. So we just, on the previous page, I think there was Gabbro listed. You can see Gabbro, very small values, and also, okay, it doesn't list it here, but schist, another type of rock, 
And you can assume they've also got very low susceptibilities because there's not much going on here. But ultra basic rocks, there's quite a bit going on. So these are probably all different intrusions. Or, um, and so you can see this is what a typical magnetic profile would look like over magnetic rocks. This, I would say, is a ground survey. As we mentioned yesterday, you can actually do aeromagnetic surveys, so flying with the aeroplane. How it usually works is these are the survey lines, you fly back and forth, fly back and forth, usually at a constant elevation. It can be anywhere from like 50 meters to 150 meters high. And then what they do at the end is they fly back along here, along these tie lines, and the reason for that is they're going to obviously compare the value that was first measured here and the second value that was measured there and check. And so it's quality checking, but also if there is an offset between them, you can shift your data if there is this offset and another tie line on that side. It's actually good also to do tie lines on a ground survey just to repeat your measurements. This is a geological map of South Africa and this is the aeromagnetic map of South Africa. And so I've got some boundaries marked in. So this boundary over here marks the edge of the craton. And has anyone heard of the word carpal craton? So it's this divide between the pink and yellow line. So the pink rocks are very, very old rocks. Yellow rocks are slightly younger. I think these are billions of years, where these rocks are about one billion years. So quite a big difference. And you can actually see it here on the magnetic data. And so this magnetic data obviously wasn't collected by walking on the ground. It would have taken forever. It was collected with an aeroplane at about 150 meters height, and the lines were about a kilometer apart. And so other things that you can see, this big anomaly that stretches across South Africa is over here in this yellow area, and nobody actually knows what it is. There's been several theories about it, but it never actually outcrops on the surface. surface. All of the rocks here are much younger rocks. They're not very magnetic. So there's this big question about what is this anomaly. Um, and it actually gets slightly shallow on the east coast, so they would like to drill it over here. It's about one or two or three kilometers over here, but it's um, the wild coast or trans sky, so it's more difficult to get drill rigs into there. It's the roads aren't that great. Um, some of the other stuff you can see, if you, are, if you zoom in, all these smaller magnetic highs are all of the dikes and sills of the Karoo. So the Karoo rocks cover a lot of South Africa, and when they finished forming, so it was all part of a sedimentary basin, so they filled up with these layers of rocks. When they finished, at about 180 million years ago, lava erupted. So there was one of the lar largest outpouring of lavas in South Africa, and so lava covered South Africa and South America and Australia and Antarctica, but also intruded at depth. So you had your sills and you had your dikes coming through, and nowadays, they uncover that surface. You can actually see that surface, and that's what a lot of these smaller red anomalies are. So that was just to give you an example of some aeromagnetic data. We've spoken about this already. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of aeromagnetic surveys in comparison to ground surveys? Advantage, fast, definitely, fast and cheap. Any disadvantages of aeromagnetic? Low resolution. Discuss whether magnetic survey could be helpful in the following cases. So this is just to start getting you familiar with geology and what rocks you would be doing in the magnetic survey. So to map dipping sandstone beds beneath the overburden. Does everyone know what overburden is? So overburden is the weathered rock below the surface. And so it's really the soils and all the, the rock between the surface and the hard rock is your overburden. And it's usually a, quite variable. And so now we've got, so this is overburden, so OB. And now we've got dipping beds of sandstone. So do you think a magnetic survey will help us with finding any of this? So the question is, is, over, is overburden magnetic and is sandstone magnetic? Sandstone, do we think it's magnetic? No. Correct. And overburden, we haven't really spoken about it. Do you think it would be magnetic or not? What's your feeling? You say not. Most likely the case. 
even if it was rocks that were magnetic, most likely they would have been weathered and the magnetic minerals would be uh, taken away. So in general, you cannot use magnetics in this first scenario. So for A, I would say it's not worth doing a magnetic survey. It would be worth doing a gravity survey because overburden usually has variable density, but say it's got a density of 2 and sandstone's got a density of 2.4, you might be able to pick up that change. So maybe you could do gravity, but I wouldn't, and seismic you could do, and resistivity you could do, but I wouldn't do it. So you can think about the next one. To determine whether an extensive lava flow is below a given area. It says below a given area, so I think they're assuming that there's something else on top, and you've got an extensive lava flow over here, lava, and then you've got something else beneath it. So, do you think you would be able to find that with magnetic? Well, let's ask the question. Is lava magnetic? It is. It's more magnetic than sandstone, but it's less magnetic than magnetite. So it is magnetic. But the question you have to ask is, is there ever a change horizontally in the lava? Because magnetics, remember, we pick up a contrast in susceptibility. So you're only ever going to pick up the edges of the lava. But this tells us it's an extensive lava flow. So I would assume that it's throughout the area, so there's no edges. So that was a tricky one. So always remember it's the contrast. So C, to locate natural cavities in limestone. So you've got a big cave system. Okay, there's a bit of water underneath, so that's water, that's just air, and so this is limestone. Is limestone magnetic? No. Similar to sandstone, there's no iron in the rocks. Is air magnetic? No, water's not magnetic either. So I would say you wouldn't find it using that method. You could use gravity. We've done this example and gravity it gave us a, a gravity low. You would probably also be able to use seismics and resistivity to find it. So D, to locate a thrusted contact between schist and gabber. Does anyone know what it, from your first year geology what a schist is? Metamorphic. Metamorphic rocks always come from some other rock. Do you remember what their parent rock was? With schist, it's usually granites that have the high pressure applied to them. And so um, granites are made up usually of quartz, feldspars, and micas. And let's go back. Does everyone know what a gabbro is? It's kind of like basalt, which is a lava, but it hasn't gone outside the earth, it's inside the earth, it's intruded inside the earth. So it's similar composition to a lava, but it's got bigger crystals because it's staying inside the earth. So you can see these two values here. I mean, gabbro is quite low. But to me, these values are so similar, I wouldn't suggest that you would, s I, I would say it would be dangerous to use magnetics. You might not be able to pick it up. You might be able to, but it's not a clear-cut answer to this one. Um, but something I wanted to ask you, just so that geologically speaking, we can draw a picture of it. Uh, thrusted contact. What do they mean by thrusted contact? So it's a fault. But what type of fault? Okay, so normal fault, this one's fault going down and that one's going up. Whereas a thrust fault, that is gone up or that one's gone down. So it doesn't make too much of a difference in this case, but just in case you see the word thrust in the future, or a reverse fault. So let's, for example, we could have had a uh, camera, and so this one would be up and that one would be down. What happens is over time, obviously, the surface gets weathered down, and so that's why you need this horizontal surface, but still you've got this top block and the, the root block going up, and this uh, football block going down. How is an aeromagnetic map of a sedimentary basin likely to differ from that over old crystalline basement rock? So you've got two situations. So sedimentary basin, what, give me an example of sedimentary rocks, sandstone and shell, 
Um, do they have a high magnetic susceptibility? No. So, therefore, most likely your aeromagnetic survey of a sedimentary basin, you're not going to see much. How is it likely to dis differ from crystalline basement rocks? So, basement crystalline rocks are usually old rocks, um, usually igneous or metamorphic, and we've already seen that igneous and metamorphic rocks um, in general have a slightly higher susceptibility than this, the sedimentary rocks. And so, therefore, doing the aeromagnetic survey over the crystalline basement rocks, you're going to pick up features here. And so, for example, if this is a profile, and you've got some faults in the basement, like that, and this is all overburden here, so this is very low susceptibility rocks. Even though this is all the same rock type, let's say granite or gabbro, you will pick up this peak. So let's say that's south and that's north, you're obviously then going to pick up this anomaly here. So you would pick up a lot more features in this crystalline basin rock because it's got a higher magnetic susceptibility than your sedimentary basin. So briefly for gravity, I mentioned to you all the things you have to do to the data. We really briefly looked at the figure. There's latitude corrections. There's, you have to correct for your height. You have to correct for the rocks between you and sea level. Quite a few corrections. Thankfully, magnetics, even though it's a more complicated method, is just one real correction. And so it's called diurnal variations. And so it's literally the variation in the Earth's magnetic field throughout the day. And so it's just from solar winds and solar particles coming in, and they create currents in our own sphere, don't they? And it's these variations that should not cause more than about 40 nanoteslas variations in the day. And so what you do is you arrive at your survey area, you take a spare magnetometer, and you set up at the base station. So gravity and magnetics have base stations and you leave it in one area, you don't move it, and it records the whole day. And the idea there is that it's not moving around, so it's not being affected by changes in rock type, it's just in one space measuring the variation, and this is typically what one clock would look like. So from 10 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon, you've got variations between, like, of about 35 nanotesla, no more than that. If you've got more than that, it's most likely there's a magnetic storm going on and you shouldn't trust your readings and you should just go home and start doing your magnetic survey. And so that's something you should double check ahead of time about what the, the magnetic weather is predicted to be during your survey. And so what you do then is that you actually minus these values from your data at the end of the day. So you're taking out these changes because you know it's not from the geology. Okay, some more questions. In each of the following magnetic surveys, how important would it be to measure the diurnal variations? So, more saying, I think it's their way of kind of asking, should you do a magnetic survey in an area? Because you should always measure diurnal variations. You should never um, not, because even if your rock type changes, there's always diurnal variations. So, more question of, would you be needing to do magnetic surveys in these areas? So, to locate the position and extent of a granite intrusion. This is a bit vague. We've already said granite is more magnetic than sandstone. So, for example, if you had a, magnet, a granite intruding into a sandstone body, you might be able to measure that variation. Um, it's, yeah, this one, you can, if you ever ask this as an exam question, you would say, if there's a significant variation between the granite and the surrounding rocks, then you would. To traverse, traverse to follow a basaltic dark across country. So we also looked at that table and we said basalt had a slightly higher um, susceptibility, but again, it depends on what the background rock type is. So it is magnetic, you would do a survey over it, but it depends what your background rock is. Um, so both A and B, I'd say, are possibilities for magnetic surveys. C, a survey to locate a normal fault in a sandstone. So we know sandstone's got a very low susceptibility. And there's sandstone on both sides here. So even though we've got a fault, you're not going to see anything. 
So this is what I mentioned earlier about the fact that um, your inclination is dependent on where on the earth you are. So it's the angle that the field is coming into the earth, and that's going to affect your model. So here you have an inclination of 45 degrees, so you can see the field coming into the earth. And you've got a circular body here. These are pluses on this side, minus on this side. Because in magnetics, you have a monopole, you've got a dipole. And so this main magnetic field is setting up a magnetic field within this body. It's inducing a magnetic field in this body. And you can see here that the blue arrows are coming out to the of the body. And so you can see again how when they're in opposite directions, they cancel out. Within, when they're in the same direction, for example, here they're all in the, in the same direction going into the body, and so that's how you're getting this positive. And so that's just why we get different shaped anomalies. But let's look at a, at a different example. When the inclination is zero, so at the equator, because you've got your magnetic field lines horizontal to the Earth, you can see then we get this negative anomaly. And it's because uh, in the opposite direction, when your main field goes here, you've got your inducing field here, they cancel out, it gives you this low. An inclination of 90, so at the magnetic poles, that's when your field lines are coming in, and so they're obviously coming in here, and your field lines are going into your body, and that's why you get this high over the body, and they cancel out on sides, and that's why you get the low on the sides. And this is just another figure to show that. So approximately at latitude of 27 north, and in South Africa we were around minus 26, 27 south. So we would have this anomaly that flipped. And you see that the case because we said this positive is always towards the equator. So in the northern hemisphere, this positive is in the south, because the equator is towards the south. Uh, north Pole, obviously, if I get, we said the equator is this low. Something else we said was depth. The depth of the body affects the anomaly. Here, this is obviously a deeper anomaly becomes broader and lower amplitude. Shallower anomaly becomes uh, much higher and much shorter wavelengths. And this is an example of some modeling. If you have a body at greater depth, um, you're going to get this broad anomaly here. So 8m is here in the full run, whereas m is this narrow one here. You would expect a higher amplitude for a shallower body. A vertical dike has a roughly east-west strike. So that means that it's going from east to west. Um, sketch the total field anomaly for the dike for each of the following latitudes, assuming there is only induced magnetization. Make clear which way your profile has been drawn. I don't want you to sketch it. Let's just use the software. The dike is striking east-west, so your profile should be going north-south. Because remember, you always go at 90 degrees to whatever you're trying to find. Your bearing should stay at zero. For each of the following latitudes, assuming there's only induced magnetization. So the way that you would be able to model this is you've got to change the declination and the inclination that you put in. So you're going to have to Google it. And so what the declination and inclination is at these latitudes.